Welcome to Emmanuel Church of Intuit. Stay tuned for this week's sermon. Now, I want to turn your attention back to the main scripture today. Our memory verse came out of it. It is Isaiah 46, but this time 9 to 11. And I want to read it to you. We don't have to remember the whole thing, but let's listen to what it says. And the word reads, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, and my man of counsel from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. Amen? Amen. The Lord says that if he has spoken, that he will do it. He is God. He is wonderful. We serve a great and mighty God. Do you know that our God is omniscient, omnipresent? omnipotent, and some of you is like, what does that mean? I will tell you, it means that how God knows everything. He is everywhere at the same time, but he's also all-powerful. That is the God we serve. There's another word to describe God, and that is the word immutable. Say immutable. Immutable means that he cannot change. It is impossible for God to change. Isn't that wonderful? That is why the scripture says in Hebrews, for Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When things go crazy around us and things change every day, especially our moods, Jesus remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is immutable. And you know that Hebrews 6 says that the purposes of God has the same immutable character than God. Hallelujah. The purposes of God is as steadfast as God himself because God doesn't change his will and his purpose will never change. I want us to leave here today with an enriched understanding about the purpose of God. That is my goal today, that we will go from here just understanding a little bit better what is the purpose of God, what is his ultimate purpose, and where do we fit into it. And to do that, we're going to briefly look at the predicament we find ourselves in, aspects of the story of God, the way he reveals his purpose in the story. And then we want to shed some light on the big picture purpose of God. Amen? Can we dive into it? Are you still with me? All right. Now, if you look around, we find ourselves in a predicament. If you don't feel that way, maybe you must just ask the person next to you to pinch you and to say, <laughs> hey, because if you open a newspaper, if you go to a YouTube channel, if you um, put on the news, what you will see is fierce debates about issues that way we may think are even illogical. Things like abortion, um, gender identities, oh, we, the list goes on, uh, human rights, child trafficking. And then most recently, it's the Israel-Gaza conflict. And um, in some ways, all of this are happening in other countries. Let's be honest. In one sense, Namibia is very, very safe. And we are still very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sheltered. Thank you for that beautiful word from my two not-so-English friends. <laughs> and, um, but if we put on the news and we just realize the times we live in, it can really feel like that puzzle piece. This snapshot in time, if you just stand back, is actually nothing more than one puzzle piece in God's bigger picture. Do you realize that? With all the chaos going on and everything may, may feel to us that it's falling apart, in God's mind, in God's view, it is one puzzle piece. Now, I listened to an interview recently. It was a secular interview. It was in the news. But they grappled with the Israel-Palestine or Israel-Gaza conflict, um, looking at the history, looking at the politics, trying literally 
to turn this puzzle piece around in a hundred many ways. But you know, they lack the biblical perspective. And I must tell you, and you have to hear this as a believer and as a disciple, that you, my friend, are privileged to information that the world doesn't have if you just read your word. If you read your Bible, there are things that God says about the times we live in that is so specific and so to the point and so accurate that it will blow your mind. And so as Christians, we are are privy to information, but we are also privy to a perspective, to a biblical perspective of things. Because you can look at the situations all around us And you can look at it through a political lens or a historical lens or a cultural lens, whatever you want to do. But how we need to approach these times is to look at it through a biblical lens. Do you guys agree with me? Am Am I still making sense so far? Praise God for making his purpose known to us ahead of time. Because it means we don't have to be shaken We don't have to be fearful. God has made it known ahead of time. Now let's quickly turn our focus and our attention back to the story of God. We ask the kids, why are stories important? And maybe you have never thought about the importance of a story, but just realize it. A story, we use stories to convey very important lesson to our kids. We use stories to give context to a situation. And if I want to know somebody better, I ask them their stories. Isn't it like that? Now, Rosie was running up and down here helping me. Thank you so much, Rosie. I'm not sure if she's in yet, but I'm going to use her as an example. Say I only met her today. I will gather a little bit of info around Rosie. How she looks like, I may meet her, I may see what mood she is in, I may meet her family, I may learn that she has a passion for e-kids and that she's involved in the church's ministry, and that is about it. Imagine I catch uh, Rosie on a bad day, when she's in a bad mood, (laughs) or when the family is not not doing all that good. I may have a perception or a picture of Rosie that is not completely accurate. But to truly understand who Rosie is and where she comes from, I listen to her stories. Isn't that so? When she tells me a story, how she grew up, how she met the Lord, how he called her, all of a sudden I have have an appreciation for this person. Now I'm only using Rosie as an example. I can also understand maybe some of her dreams and goals for the future. Now, God has given us the biblical narrative, the Bible of the story, so that we as Christians can understand where we come from, who we are, and where we are going to. Amen? Our identity is no longer rooted in the things of the world, where the world is going or what happened in the world, in the worldly sense, or maybe before we were believers. Yes, we are shaped by those things. But our identities is grounded in the fact that we are children of God. And this biblical story, the narrative of the Bible, gives us a sense where we come from, who we are, and where we are going. Amen. Now, it's very important that we also realize that we have to tackle the story of the Bible with care. There's some pitfalls and some dangers that we can easily fall into, and we want to avoid that. The first one is not having the full story. Imagine that. Somebody coming to you, give you some juicy details, and afterwards you figure out, but this was not the whole story. That could be kind of problematic, nay? Yes, so having the full story is very important. We are sometimes, when we look at the biblical narrative, guilty of Focusing on some aspects while we completely ignore other aspects. You may ask, but is it even possible? I would say yes, it is, because you find Christians or people that focuses on creation, but they ignore the cross. So they know God as a creator, but they don't accept Jesus Christ's 
redemptive work on the cross. Or we can be, uh, we can focus on the death of Jesus and ignoring the fact that he is risen or even denying the fact that he has risen from the grave. Paul says of such people in 1 Corinthians 15 that their faith is in vain. Do you see that? It is very important to pick up the story from the beginning to see what God wants to do until the very end. A second mistake we make is that we end the story in the wrong place. Maybe we put a full stop after Jesus' ascension to heaven. Well, I'm born again, Jesus is in heaven, I'm waiting for him to return. Amen. We are all waiting for Jesus to return, but in our waiting there is something that we do and there's a living hope that we have that he will return again and that we will inherit the eternal life. But maybe we think about eternal life as the end of something and not the beginning of a brand new and wonderful rebuilding of the world which is centered on God's glory. Have you ever thought about that? I'm gonna pause here for a little bit because I know I'm so guilty that for the longest time I just saw living our lives rapture in heaven forever. You know, nothing beyond that, no story beyond that. But the interesting thing is that God gives us prophecies about life after the rapture, life eternally. You know that about one third of the Bible is predictive text. That means it's prophecy. It is prophets foretelling something that will happen in the future. And of all those prophecies, a half of them have been fulfilled to the point, very accurately. Now, what does it say to us about the other half? Can we trust God to fulfill the prophecies in his word? If Jesus was prophesied, it was said of him that he will come the first time as a servant and it happened like that, can we believe the word when it says he will come a second time and reign as king? Amen, we can. So it's very important for us to see that God's story is still being written on the pages of history. You know, and just one other interesting thing is that um, I heard it said, I looked for it again but couldn't find it, but I heard this from, from somebody that, that is a, a well-known scholar that for every one prophecy about Jesus' first coming, there's eight prophecies about his second coming or the end times. Do you know that? So we asked the kids a little bit earlier. Do you think God wants us to know his plan? Do you think God wants us to know his purpose? And we all said, yeah. You know, like, yeah, we think so. I want to tell you that God, God has revealed it in so many ways, in so many scriptures throughout his word, that there is no doubt that he wants us to know, firstly, that he has a bigger purpose. Secondly, he is still in control. He is still the one writing out the story. And thirdly, it is not the end yet, guys. All right. Now, there's one more mistake we make, and I don't want to spend too long on this because it can become very long, but we can be unaware of the characters in God's story. We, firstly, we can make the mistake of thinking we're the main characters. We won't say it, of course. I mean, but Jesus is, you know, he's, I, he's part of my story. I'm not part of his story. That's how it works out. But God is not part of our story. We're part of his story. Do you hear the difference? And Emmanuel isn't part of, God is not part of Emmanuel's story. Emmanuel is part of, part of God's story. Namibia is part of God's story. America is part of God's story. Israel is part of God's story. Amen? And so we mustn't confuse the main character who is God himself. And the purpose is that he will be glorified. Amen? Other mistake we make is that there are two distinct characters, characters that we sometimes confuse as one, and that is Israel and the church. And maybe you've come into, in church long enough to have heard teaching about Israel and to have heard teaching about the church, but maybe you are a brand new Christian and you don't really know how these things fit in together. 
And I just quickly want to tell you today that Israel is still God's chosen people. He has chosen them for a purpose. And that purpose was to benefit them, that their Savior, their Messiah would come from their line. But it was also for the benefit of the nations. It was never just about Israel. But Israel is almost like God's vehicle, like the ones he chose to accomplish his purpose. And so God is still busy with Israel. It is so clear from the word that he is still in a process with Israel and he's still dealing with Israel. And they will do so until a time where they accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Because for the most part, it's only individual Jews that have accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But the Jewish nation as a whole have rejected him. And if you are unaware, Jesus is a Jew. And he came for the salvation of the Jew, but he also came for the salvation of the church, for the Gentiles. And the Gentiles that have put their faith in Jesus Christ, we are now his bride. We are the church. Amen? I want to make it clear, whether we are Jew or Gentile, whether we're from the land of Israel or the land of Namibia, which is the land of the brave, by the way, we have one way to salvation, one way to the Father, and that is through believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and what he has done on the cross, the atonement work on the cross. Amen? Amen. All right. So, and um, then the last thing is that there are more characters in God's story that we sometimes realize. Yes, there's God. Yes, there's Israel. Yes, the church. But the biblical narrative talks about Satan, fallen angels, heaven and earth, death, and even sin. There are many characters in God's story. And the good news is that Jesus has dealt with our sin. Amen? In that sense, sin is our problem because we have to sanctify ourselves and we have to crucify the flesh. But God has dealt with sin. Sin is not intimidating to God. It's not a problem because he has paid the full price to forgive us of all our sin. And all we need to do is come to him because if we confess he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But when we read this narrative of the Bible, we see that God is yet to deal with the rebellion of Satan and fallen angels and the world as a whole. So God has dealt with sin, but he will still deal with rebellion. Amen. So that is just a little bit of something to, to maybe open up our, our thoughts, our minds about what the story of the Lord is. Now, I came to that point where I want to just shed light on the purpose of God. Um, what does the story of God or the story of the, the Bible reveal about God's purpose? That is the connection I made right from the beginning when I said God's purpose is revealed through this biblical narrative. Are you still with me? He gives us the story to give us insight, to make it real to us. And to do that, I realized that I will give, have to give you a kind of an outline or highlights about God's story. I am very afraid to do it because I'm very afraid to do the story of God any injustice. Because the story of God, while it is simple and easy to understand, it is also deep and profound and impactful. And it is not my heart to take away any aspect that is important. But you know, sometimes what happens, I remember this was the case for me. I heard about Daniel and I heard about Joseph and I heard about Moses and I heard about Abraham and later Jesus and Paul and Peter, but I could never see the story for what it is as a whole. So we have these characters in the Bible with inspiring lives or big mistakes and either way, they teach us a lesson because that is the purpose of stories or a big benefit of stories. But I could never see the whole story of God until it was explained to me. So that is what I want to do today. And again, if I do the story injustice, please bear with me, please be merciful, but let's press on. We know that there is a, in the beginning, there is a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is the creation story as we know it. It is not an evolution story. It's a creator who created the world 
in six days. We have the first 11 chapters of Genesis just speaking about the lives of the first people who lived on earth. But then they rebelled towards God to such an extent that he was sorry that he made man. But God didn't change his purpose or his plan because the purposes of God is unchangeable. So he didn't destroy people altogether. Noah found favor in his sight and he rebuilt this humanity out of that family. Amen. Are you still with me? From Abram's line came, ah, from Noah's line came Abram. And at some point, God called Abram aside. He sent him to a, to a place called Canaan. And he made him this promise. And he said, in you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Why is that? Because the Messiah was to come from the seed of Abram. Amen. We can give God glory for that. Come on, people. We... Then... Um, there was the patriarchs. Then the people went to Egypt because of hunger and Joseph prepared the way. Moses led them out of Egypt and the law was given. The law, as it is explained in the New Testament, is a tutor. I believe it taught the people about the character of God. His justice, but also his mercy and his order and his love and everything that surrounds that. But then for a long while, People were under the law. In that time, there was also the kings because the people decided they rejected God as their king and they wanted to be like all the other nations. So in that striving to be like all the other nations, they kept on failing time after time, giving up their one true God for idol worship. It is during that time, well, a few hundred years later, that Jesus Christ was born. Uh, born of a virgin in a major, and um, he would grow up and his life would also be an example for us. But to say that Jesus' life is only a good example for us is a very, very, very big misinterpretation and, and underestimation because he was the son of God, the one who didn't count equality with God something to be grasped, but he came in the likeness of human flesh. He became like us and he dwelt among us. And now we have a high priest in heaven who can sympathize with our needs because he was tempted in every way that we were tempted, yet without sin. Imagine that. Living in this world for 30 plus years without sin. How are you doing, Zed? You're just about 30. No, not so good. All right. There is just a little bit of humor relief there. Jesus died, but on the third day, he was rose again. He appeared to many who could testify that this Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. And after 40 days, he ascended to heaven, where he is now our high priest interceding for us. Amen. Jesus did it disappear off the sea, nowhere to be found until he comes back. He is interceding for us. He is reminding when the devil comes, the accuser comes, Jesus has said, but by my blood, he is forgiven. And um, we are waiting, but not passively, because when Jesus ascended, he told the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Amen. So we weren't left orphans because we received the Holy Spirit. We also weren't left powerless because we received the Holy Spirit. But for the reason to be his witnesses, to expand the kingdom of God, to proclaim the kingdom of God on this earth. Now, there's a time, and the next thing on God's calendar, I believe, is the rapture. Nothing else needs to be fulfilled. God warned that the rapture will come at a time when we don't expect it. He said there will be 10 virgins, five will have oil in their lambs and five not. And the five who has oil in the lambs, they will go with it. The doors will be open to them. And then the doors will be shut. He says two will be washing clothes and then one of them will be gone. What two will be sleeping in a bed? And then the rapture is what we call imminent. It can happen at any moment. And church, I know that it's a little bit of a cliche, 
let's be honest. When somebody says, oh, Jesus is coming soon, some of you are like, yeah, Paul said that too, you know. That has been said. I want to say to you, Jesus said, look at the fig tree. Look at the, the signs of the times. Don't be unwise. We are living in a time that has been prophesied in the Bible, and we are expecting our Savior to come for his bride every, any day now. Amen. So let's be ready. Let's have the oil in our lamps. Then, shortly after that, there's a time of tribulation. Now, I want to risk this and to say that the tribulation is not primarily a time of persecution. Yes, there will be persecution, but the tribulation is the wrath of God being poured out. It is specifically a time that he deals with Israel for not accepting the Messiah. It is a time where there will be a peace treaty and a euro, but that euro will turn out to be the Antichrist when he comes and he sets himself up in the temple of God. And people are divided about this. But I believe that God will save his bride from the hour of wrath. That we will be with him in heaven. But that is why it's so important to tell others about him. Amen. Thank the Lord that that is not the end of the story. I mean. But this is the essence of our Christian hope. You know, when you go through a difficult time, you will always say to yourself, if you really believe in Jesus and you trust that he can carry you through, you will say, it's going tough now, but it will go better. But I know the Lord will carry me through. The same, the essence of our Christian hope is what we have in this situation. It will become tough, but, there's a but, my friends. Then Jesus will come back. The Bible talks about a battle that is called Armageddon. It talks about binding Satan, Satan binding him for a thousand years. It talks about throwing the Antichrist and false prophet into the pit of hell. And it talks about Jesus Christ coming and reigning on earth for a thousand years. And um, what a marvelous idea. That under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, he will be glorified, he will be magnified, but this world will re be rebuilt to the glory it was supposed to have. Remember that scripture in Romans where it says creation is eagerly awaiting the revelation of the sons of God. It is experiencing birth pains for that time to come to fruition, for it to be set free that it can be, yeah, for it to experience that kind of liberty again. So, we have the thousand years, and without getting um, too deep into it, the Bible does say very clearly in Revelation that Satan will be released for a time to see we can deceive. So, after the thousand years, there's a time to, for the enemy to deceive whom he can, and after that, there will be the final battle. When death is conquered, Satan is conquered, they're all thrown into hell. And unfortunately, everyone that rebelled with Satan will also be thrown into the fires of hell. Then, and there will be a white throne judgment. Then comes the new heaven and the new Jerusalem. Amen? God creates a new heaven and a new Jerusalem. Now, to elaborate a little bit of that, um, we said the times we are living in is like a snapshot. If we just stand back and we look, we, we see the puzzle piece, we see the snapshot. But let's look at the snapshot that the book of Revelation gives us about that time, the new heaven and the new Jerusalem. All right, let's read. Because, yeah, one could, one could almost say it's like the picture on the box. It is just something we have to look forward to. And this is in the Bible in Revelation 21, and then I'm going to read Revelation 22, just a few verses. Revelation 21, verse 1 to 3. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Amen. A promise of God's presence forevermore. Revelations 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the lamp through the middle of the street to the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be night, night will be there no more. They will, they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. It's a beautiful snapshot. It's a beautiful picture on the box. It's a beautiful picture of what we are looking forward to. But you know, it goes even deeper than that because in the verse that we have read, we said, God said, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. In other words, in God's wonderful um, ability to know everything, he could declare the end from the beginning because he didn't only know what his purpose was, but he knew how he would accomplish his purpose. And he says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. So this picture, this snapshot, we have an assurance that God will accomplish that. But other than that, he gave us clues, even in the creation story. In the first three chapters of the Bible, we find themes that repeat themselves throughout the Bible and then again in the last two chapters of Revelation. And you wondered if a man wrote the Bible. Just quickly want to stop there. If you look at the themes and how it's weaving together, you must realize that the hand of God is in it. All right, so just to mention some of those themes. In Genesis, in the beginning, God creates a heaven and an earth. In Revelation, he creates a new heaven and a new earth. In Genesis 3, man is driven out of Eden. They're driven out of the garden, away from the presence of the Lord, because Eden represents the place where they walked with God. In Revelation 21 and 22, they are welcomed home to the eternal dwelling, but into the presence of God, be, never to be separated again, because God says, I will be their God, and they will be my people. In Genesis 3, when man is driven out of the garden, they are cut off from the river that flows, and from the tree of life. And you know, in the New Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit is the river, and that Jesus says that streams of living water will to come through us, and that we have life because Jesus died on a cursed tree. But in Revelation, there's a river that flows from the temple, and there's a river that flows through the city, and there's the tree that bears fruit, um, and the fruit is for healing of the nations. Access to the river and the tree then is fully restored. In Genesis, we find a bridegroom and a bride. The bridegroom being Adam and his bride Eve. And they, they, they're the first marriage that the Bible records. Also records the purpose of marriage, by the way. In the last chapters, we found Jesus, the bridegroom. The church, his bride, and the wedding feast of the Lamb. Isn't that amazing? In Genesis 3, the earth is cursed. In Revelation 22, the curse is abolished. In Genesis, also death enters, but in Revelation, death is completely destroyed. Lastly, 
Well, second, lastly, in Genesis 3, man sins. And we call it the fall of man. Because at that time, we fell short of the glory of God. That is how Romans 3 puts it. But in 1 John 3 verse 2, it says that we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. We will be completely restored as image bearers of God. Amen. God also said to the people in Genesis 3, you will reign and you will subdue the earth. And you had a mandate for them. You had a purpose for them. And what did we do? We gave dominion to the devil. But in Revelation 22, it talks about how we will reign with him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Yes, God is good. God is good all the time.